Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger, and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we host over 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org, or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. On behalf of our literary committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event, featuring author Janice Nimura, who shares with us her latest book and New York Times bestseller, The Doctors Blackwell, about the lives of doctors and sisters, Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell, two complicated pioneers who exploded the limits of possibility. In 1857, they founded the first hospital staffed entirely by women, the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and children right here in New York. They prevailed against fierce resistance from the male establishment moving around Britain, France, and America during a tumultuous time of scientific discovery. Janice Nimura received a Public Scholar Award from the National Endowment for the Humanities in support of her work on the Doctors Blackwell. Her previous book, Daughters of the Samurai, A Journey from East to West and Back, was a New York Times notable book in 2015. Tonight's feature book can be purchased from our preferred independent bookseller, Books on Call, and we'll be sharing a link in the chat shortly. Books on Call will also reach out to anyone who uses the link to see if you'd like a signed copy. Following the discussion or presentation um, will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Janice. Please enjoy her presentation. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, uh, I'm astonished. It is the silver lining of, of this virtual moment that we get to have so many of us here together in this space in an important week for women physicians. Thursday is National Women Physicians Day. It's also Elizabeth Blackwell's 201st birthday, and that's not a coincidence. Um, anyway, it is, it is always an honor to, to, to bring a story to the National Arts Club. I'm sorry that we can't be there in person, but um, I'm thrilled that, to share this story with so many tonight. So, the doctor's Blackwell. Um, you may be familiar with the name Elizabeth Blackwell. Um, if you are, it's usually followed in your mind by the phrase first woman doctor. She was the first woman in America to receive a medical degree in 1849. Her sister Emily followed her to become the third woman in America to receive a medical degree in 1854. And as you just heard together, they founded the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children and then the Women's Medical College of the New York Infirmary. So. I encountered the Blackwell story for the first time six years ago. Um, and this was startling to me. I had grown up and still live in the city where they practiced. I was the product of a proudly feminist all girls school that I attended from the age of five all the way till college. I, I, I was the math science kid at that school. I entered college intending to pursue medicine, although I was seduced by the humanities. Um, how could I have never heard of Elizabeth Blackwell, let alone Emily? Um, so I went looking for them, uh, trying to find out how I had missed them somehow. And I discovered that they aren't hard to find on the children's biography shelf. Um, there we go. Oops. All right. Um, on the children's biography shelf, there are several versions of them. Um, they all share a lot in common. This is a chapter book from the 1940s. Um, the illustrations always feature a slim, elegant, well-dressed young woman with a stethoscope bending solicitously over a grateful patient. Um, here's the modern middle grade version. Again, nice clothes, stethoscope, grateful patient, 
Here's the modern picture book version with a slightly younger, perkier version of Elizabeth with cute red hair bows. But there's the stethoscope in the bag waiting for her to grow up. Um, these books are fine as far as they go. They tell an inspiring story of a woman who broke boundaries uh, and meant to um, inspire young girls to be whatever they wanna be. Um, but as I followed the Blackwells into the archives and started to listen to their voices, I found two very different women. First of all, Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell looked like this. And if they, they were never photographed, holding stethoscopes. And if they had been um, around the age in the 19, in the 1840s, excuse me, when uh, they were as young as the women in the picture books, even stethoscopes would have looked like this. So there was clearly um, a lot that had been smoothed out in these picture books, sanitized, um, simplified. Um, and as I started to listen to Elizabeth and Emily's voices in their own journals and letters, um, I discovered two very complicated women. Um, and I became very eager to know their whole story uh, and not just what fits in a picture book. So what is that story? Briefly. Eight out of the nine Blackwell siblings were born in Bristol, England. Uh, they came to this country as children in 1832. They were the sons and daughters of a man who was something of a paradox. He had made his money in the sugar refining industry. Bristol was a capital of the sugar trade, but he spent most of his free time as an ardent abolitionist. There's a contradiction there if you think about that for a minute. Um, his money had been made on a commodity that depended on enslaved labor in the Caribbean. Um, he clung to a dream his whole life of finding a way to make sugar from sugar beets that could be farmed in the North and thereby sanitize the moral hygiene of his industry. He was a dreamer. Um, he raised his five daughters to be educated at the same level as his four sons. And on the strength of his dream of, um, of, a, of a more moral form of sugar, he moved the family all the way from Bristol to the new world, first to New York in 1832, and then in 1838, all the way out to the edge of the known universe, which at that point was Cincinnati, um, hoping to find a way to grow sugar beets. He got his family, now nine children, because the youngest, George Washington Blackwell, had been born in New York. All nine children and his wife, um, all the way to Cincinnati in 1838, and then he died, leaving them with nothing. Um, and leaving his daughters with a clear sense that having a husband, no matter how beloved, is not a guarantee of security. None of his five daughters ever married. So here are the Blackwells, nine children and a widowed mother at the edge of the universe um, with nothing. They become at this point a real tribe, a clan, uh, more important to each other um, than they are to anyone else. Um, and they spend the rest of their lives bonded in this way. They all sort of also drive each other a little nuts. So they're always leaving to each other and writing back to each other, thereby furnishing their biographer with an enormous gift, which is thousands of letters um, from, from them to each other, writing about each other so that I was able to braid a story with many different perspectives. Um, this, in case you are curious about 19th century archival research, is often what early 19th century letters look like. Postage and paper were quite expensive then. So what you did was called cross writing. You filled the page from top to bottom and then you turned it 90 degrees and filled it again right on top. Um, sometimes you flip the page and did the same thing on the back. Um, this is Henry Blackwell writing to his big sister Elizabeth in 1844. He actually has gorgeous handwriting. And this isn't actually that hard to read if you get used to it. I happen to love this kind of decoding. I know it's not for everyone. Anyway, uh, a close up view of cross writing. Um, so Elizabeth was born in 1821. Uh, she was voraciously brilliant, socially quite awkward, and blessed with a healthy sense of her own self-worth. Uh, coming of age in the um, 1840s, she was inspired by the transcendentalist writer Margaret Fuller, who had just published a best-selling book called Woman in the 19th Century. 
Uh, this book would have been part of the Blackwell's library. Uh, and in that book, Margaret Fuller argued that humanity was not going to reach a new level of enlightenment until women unleashed their own power. Women could be anything, argued Margaret Fuller. They could be sea captains if they wanted to. It had nothing to do with sex. It had only to do with talent and effort. Um, and until women proved this to themselves and to the world, humanity would not rise. And Elizabeth reading this began to think of herself as someone whose own life might help prove Margaret Fuller's point. She began to think of herself as someone who could be a beacon to other women and help them understand their own power. So she needed to find a way to prove Margaret Fuller's point. And she chose medicine, which was an unusual and very strategic choice. She chose it not because she loved science, not because she wanted to heal the sick. She didn't really like taking care of people. She thought sickness was a form of weakness. She thought bodily functions were disgusting. She chose medicine because in the mid 1840s, it was an unusually clear way to prove the point she wanted to make. Medicine was redefining itself, both scientifically and institutionally. To this point, it had been considered more of a trade, the trade of midwives or barber surgeons. Um, now, increasingly, it was considered a profession, a profession of men who were credentialed by virtue of having gone to a medical school and received a medical degree. And increasingly, there were medical schools in the United States. So it seemed to Elizabeth that if a woman could find her way into a med school, sit through all the lectures, pass all of the examinations and receive a diploma, who could argue she wasn't as qualified to practice medicine as any man? And as this cartoon suggests, um, med medical school in the 1840s was not the uh, almost insurmountable intellectual challenge that medical school is today. Um, in the 1840s, medical school was where you went if you weren't smart enough to pursue the law or divinity. Uh, medical school consisted of two identical 16-week terms of lectures. If you were really lucky, you got to maybe do a little dissection. Um, these were identical terms repeated one year after the next. In the middle, you might go away to get a little practical experience somewhere, but you could emerge from medical school having almost no experience with a living patient. Um, Elizabeth was pretty sure, given that she liked to read Pascal for fun, that if she could find her way into a medical school, she would have very little trouble finding her way through and out the other side. So to find a seat in medical school, harder than it sounded uh, in the 1840s, the very idea of a woman wanting to practice medicine was outrageous, not just because being a doctor was outside the accepted professions for women. If you were a woman and you wanted to work, you could be a teacher, you could maybe be a nurse, you could maybe write but being a doctor was outside of a woman's sphere. On top of that, what kind of woman, what kind of lady would choose to sit in a lecture hall full of men and study the intricate workings of the human body? That was appalling. Um, people thought Elizabeth Blackwell must either be insane or at least just wicked. Um, she was met with either derision from the doctors that she spoke to about med school, or, um, or, or, or a blank wall. Some of them wouldn't even meet with her. They were too outraged by the very idea of what she was asking. She amassed a sheaf of rejection letters. And then finally, at the age of 26, she received a letter of acceptance from tiny rural Geneva Medical College in Geneva, New York. Um, on the left is the Geneva Medical College building as it once stood on the right, the spot where it used to be. Um, Geneva College has evolved into Hobart and William Smith Colleges um, today. The story of her admission is one of those interesting moments where you have to um, take a couple of different versions of the story and blend them together to get at something that was close to the truth. If you read Elizabeth Blackwell's memoir written 50 years later, it sounds like after much struggle, uh, a wonderful letter of acceptance arrived. She celebrated, um, bought a train ticket to Geneva, New York, and off she went. 
Interestingly, in the appendix to that same memoir is a different account of her acceptance written by her classmate, Dr. Stephen Smith, who went on to be a very prominent physician in New York City. Um, it's interesting that she included it, even though she didn't put it up front with the rest of the memoir. Stephen Smith told the story this way. One day at the beginning of the term, a professor walked into the lecture hall carrying a letter from a rather prominent Philadelphia physician who was mentoring a young woman named Elizabeth Blackwell and who had written to the faculty of Geneva College recommending that she come and study. And the faculty at Geneva College, again, a, a provincial, rather low key, not particularly prestigious place, were not quite brave enough to say no to this prominent Philadelphia physician, but they also really didn't want a woman to come. So they punted the question to the students and said, okay, boys, you vote on whether this woman should join us. If any one of you says no, she won't come. And they figured they were safe. The boys, again, a rather provincial raucous bunch, um, not the most polished crew and um, very eager for mischief, recognized that their professors were being somewhat cowardly and at a raucous meeting of the students that evening, bludgeoned into submission the one or two people who weren't so sure about this and returned a unanimous yes to the faculty the next morning and then promptly forgot all about it. They assumed this was a practical joke being played on them by a rival medical school. Surely it couldn't be real until three weeks later when Elizabeth Blackwell walked into the lecture hall. Once arrived in Geneva and once able to learn from um, specimens rather than textbooks, um, she found that medicine was actually an intellectual challenge that was up to her level, and she began to warm to her subject, at least as, a, as an intellectual challenge. Um, she rose to the top of the class, and she earned the respect of her fellow students who realized that they were going to do better if they sat next to Elizabeth. Um, between medical school terms in the summer of 1848, she went back to Philadelphia, where she found her way here to Blockley Alms House, at this moment, the most, uh, the largest municipal hospital in America. Um, quick sidebar, hospital in the 1840s did not mean what hospital means to us today. A hospital was not a place you went for healing. If you had any resources at all, a doctor would come to you at home. If you had to go to a hospital, it meant that you had nowhere else to go. Hospitals, um, in Professor David Oshinsky of NYU's words, were warehouses for the destitute. Um, and Elizabeth found her way to a room for the summer off the female syphilis ward, surely one of the most miserable spaces in this house of misery. Um, she began there all of a sudden, confronted with more practical experience than she'd ever seen in her life, to make connections between poverty and public health, between venereal disease and the plight of women that were quite formative. It was also the summer of 1848 and waves of refugees were arriving from Ireland and from continental Europe, um, bearing with them what was then called ship fever, uh, now typh typhoid fever. Um, um, infected refugees overflowed the beds at Blockley onto pallets on the floor. And Elizabeth decided to write her thesis for Geneva Medical College on epidemic typhus. Sorry, that was typhus, not typhoid. Um, I think rather pointedly choosing a thesis topic that was not gynecological in any way. Uh, she was not going to be a, 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 make any concessions to, to sex in her pursuit of a medical degree. Um, that thesis on typhus uh, ran as the lead article in the Buffalo Medical Journal to coincide with her graduation in January of 1849. Um, she didn't just make her way through medical school, she blazed through medical school and graduated at the top of the class. Then she needed more practical training. And so she did what many American medical graduates did to burnish their reputations and set themselves up for a successful practice, she went to Europe where the true capitals of medical education were. She went to Paris, um, Paris being the, the pretty much the foremost um, center of progressive medical education at this time. There was state sponsored uh, costless medical lecturing going on. Um, there was a lot of practical instruction at the bedside. 
Um, Elizabeth arrived in Paris excited to begin and discovered that none of that education was open to her because she refused to disguise herself as a man. And as a woman, she could not enter the lecture halls. Um, the whole point of this exercise in her life was to prove what a woman could do. She was not going to do this medical work in disguise. So she ended up here at La Maternité, um, a municipal obstetric hospital in an old convent, which still stands. I got to go and explore it and take this picture as part of my research. La Maternité was a hospital to which young women from all over France came as students to live in dormitories and learn how to be midwives. Elizabeth Blackwell already had a medical degree and she was much older than they were, all the other students. But she realized that here she would actually have access to a high volume of cases and actually be able to do practical work in a way that she wouldn't be able to do anywhere else in Paris. So she signed up as a student and lived in the dormitory. Um, as I said, a hospital was not a place you went if you had the money to get a doctor to come to you at home. So the women delivering babies in this hospital were at the end of the line. They were destitute. Many of them were prostitutes. Many of them were infected with venereal disease. Um, when a baby passes through the birth canal of a woman infected with gonorrhea, the baby can contract an infection called gonorrheal conjunctivitis, an eye infection. And Elizabeth Blackwell, um, was uh, cleaning the eyes of an infected baby early one morning in the nursery when some of the washing liquid splashed up into her face and she herself contracted gonorrheal conjunctivitis, a crisis which would change the shape of her career, if not its direction. Um, Today, that, that infection would be easily treatable with antibiotics, but in 1849, when this took place, it was a catastrophe and she was immediately confined to a bed in the hospital where she had been working. Um, and the fate of her vision hung in the balance for weeks as all of the rather barbaric treatments of 1840s medicine were applied to her case. Um, this is another one of those moments where you have to braid multiple accounts into something that approximates the truth. Um, she was attended by her colleague, the wonderfully named Dr. Hippolyte Blo, um, who, had been her colleague and was now her own physician. Um, this is how she wrote about the incident in her memoir, again, 50 years later. Ah, how dreadful it was to find the daylight gradually fading as my kind doctor bent over me and removed with an exquisite delicacy of touch the films that had formed over the pupil. I could see him for a moment clearly, but the sight soon vanished and the eye was left in darkness. Sounds like a romance novel, right? And Dr. Blow could definitely fulfill the role of leading man. Um, luckily for Elizabeth, at this very moment in Paris happened to be her eldest sister, Anna Blackwell. Um, I love the suggestive pose in this photo. Anna Blackwell was um, a hypochondriac, a bit of a drama queen and a journalist. And she spent her days at her sister's bed, bedside, desperately trying to help her sister come through this crisis. And in the evenings, Anna would go back and write endless letters home to Cincinnati, detailing the plight of Anna's, of Elizabeth's eye. And here's how she wrote about it. The pupil presents just now the appearance of one of those little misshapen blackberries of three granulations and half dried up that one sees so often on some scrubby little bush if you can fancy one such in dull looking lead, you have just the appearance of this poor eye. Mm. A very different account. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell ended up losing one eye and wearing a glass prosthetic for the rest of her life. Uh, if you squint hard at this portrait, you can see there is a very slight asymmetry in her gaze, um, but many people never knew she had a disability. Uh, she didn't talk about it. It did, however, change her path. Surgery was now no longer an option with one eye. Uh, even reading and writing could be hard and, and painful. And so this injury, though it didn't deter her from her path, um, it oriented her more and more toward a direction she was already heading um, temperamentally, which was toward public health, toward thinking about medicine, thinking about larger ideas um, about human health and writing and speaking about those ideas rather than actually treating patients. Did she go back to Cincinnati to recover and get used to her 
new um, disability? No, she went on to London to continue her training. This is one of those moments in the story that just I find awe inspiring um, to be a woman alone in pain and yet to hold on to your path is astonishing to me. Um, she went to London to St. Bartholomew's Hospital to continue her training. And in London, she made a fateful acquaintance. A mutual friends introduced her to a young woman named Florence Nightingale, who in 1851 was not the global celebrity she would soon become as the heroine of the Crimean War, as the lady with the lamp. Um, Florence Nightingale at this point was just a young woman from a wealthy family chafing against her family's instructions to settle down and get married. She had big ideas about what she wanted to achieve in the field of health, um, and she did not want to just become a wife. I like to think that her encounter with Elizabeth Blackwell in this moment became a catalyst for her career. Because here's Elizabeth Blackwell, a woman just her age, who has earned a medical degree and left her family and any thoughts of marriage behind in the US. She's now wandering all over Europe getting medical experience. Elizabeth Blackwell is proof that what Florence Nightingale imagines is possible. And they have this instant and ecstatic friendship. They spend hours together walking and discussing ideas about hygiene and um, how to organize hospitals. Um, they do, however, hit upon a basic difference in their thinking, which is that Florence Nightingale believes the role of women in medicine is as nurses. And Elizabeth Blackwell has staked her life on proving that women can be doctors. And this is something they never will align on. Um, there is always a connection between them. They never stop communicating throughout their different careers, but there's always a, a bit of tension between them two and some envy, I think. Elizabeth Blackwell was never anywhere near as good at public relations as Florence Nightingale was. And I think there was some envy of her fame. So now it's time for Elizabeth Blackwell, having finished her training to set up a practice. And she decides that it will be in New York that she will go and do that. So she goes back to New York, expecting to hang out her shingle and instantly have a successful practice um, of patient, female patients who are so grateful to be able to confide their intimate ailments to a woman rather than having to discuss them with a man. She finds a space in which to work in New York on University Place and no one comes. Why not? Well, in 1852 now, the very phrase female physician does not mean bright young woman with a medical degree. It means someone like this, Madame Restel, the notorious Fifth Avenue abortionist, um, caricatured here in the National Police Gazette as a baby eating demon. Um, a female physician was someone who worked on the wrong side of the law, in the shadows. Nice women did not uh, overtly or explicitly consult a female physician. And Elizabeth Blackwell in this moment found herself becalmed all of a sudden after all of this training um, she began to feel a little bit of dismay that um, this was not going to be the slam dunk she had assumed it would be. Meanwhile, she had anointed her sister Emily, five years younger, to follow her into the profession. She knew that being a woman in medicine was going to be a steep and lonely path. She thought more highly of her own brothers and sisters than anyone else in the world. So she chose her next youngest and most brilliant sister, Emily, to follow her. And Emily actually had quite a bit of natural affinity for science. Um, and she also, I think, was used to doing what her three older and rather domineering sisters told her to do. So she took up the challenge um, and agreed that she would pursue the same path. You would think that being the second Blackwell sister to attempt to enter medical school, she would have an easier time, but you would be wrong. Um, in the years since Elizabeth Blackwell had graduated from Geneva, um, Gene even Geneva, among all the other men's medical schools, had barred its doors against women. Um, the, the, the medical establishment was appalled at, at Elizabeth Blackwell's success um, and uh, vowed even more firmly not to allow women to study among their students. Um, meanwhile, complicating the situation, uh, two female medical colleges had opened in Philadelphia and in Boston. So the men's colleges had an even better an even easier way to reject a female applicant. Go to the women's medical college. That's the place for you. 
Emily didn't want to. She didn't. She she and Elizabeth agreed that women's medical colleges were mediocre and inferior by definition. Um, and Emily did not want a degree that was any less prestigious than the one her sister had earned. So she persevered and won herself a spot at Rush Medical College in Chicago. Uh, after one year of the two years that she needed to study, they asked her not to return, having become uncomfortable with a woman on campus. Um, she pivoted and found another spot at Cleveland Medical College, uh, which has since evolved into Case Western, and she got her degree there in 1854. Then she too needed some practical experience. So I think maybe deliberately she chose the one um, European medical capital that Elizabeth hadn't studied in, which was Edinburgh. She made her way to Edinburgh and attached herself to the practice of James Young Simpson, who in this moment, now 1854, was probably one of the most prominent physicians in Britain. He was the professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Edinburgh, one of the premier medical institutions in Europe. He was by appointment to the queen. He was the man who in 1847 had discovered the anesthetic properties of chloroform. The story went that he discovered the anesthetic properties of chloroform by passing a decanter of chloroform around at his dining table, whereupon all of his dinner guests burst into hysterical laughter and passed out under the table. Um, he was a bit of a showman, and I think he probably enjoyed the shock value of having a female assistant among his group of assistants. The story went that he um, he enjoyed shouting into the next room, Dr. Blackwell, could you come here, please? And then enjoying the shock when um, a woman walked through the door and everyone gaped. Um, at the same time, he was very respectful of Emily's talents. She was a brilliant young woman uh, and he was a man working at the top of his craft and he taught her a great deal. Uh, the use of instruments like these in his obstetric practice um, uh, down below Simpson's uterine sound, an instrument Simpson himself had invented, a, a sort of a graduated probe to measure the dimensions of the cervix, um, a pessary, which would have been used in cases of uterine prolapse to hold the uterus in place. Um, Simpson was a pioneer of the pelvic exam, something Emily initially found a little startling, but came to respect as the powerful diagnostic tool that it was. Um, so Emily is learning at the top of the game and she's writing letters furiously home to Elizabeth. You can see her sketching those instruments on the left side of this letter. Um, she is learning a great deal in this moment and Elizabeth is waiting and waiting in New York for something to happen. Um, the, the, the tables have turned a little bit. Um, from the beginning, I in, was intent on making this book a double portrait, the story of both sisters and not just Elizabeth Blackwell, first woman doctor. Um, but the source material is lopsided by nature. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell wrote more, more was written about her, more of her writings were preserved. Um, so what do you do when you want to make a double portrait, but there's just not as much material about one of your subjects? Well, one of the things you can do is one of my favorite things to do, which is to get out of the library, out of the archives and go follow your subjects around. So I gathered up Emily's Edinburgh letters and I went to Edinburgh and tried to do and feel and see everything that she had done while she was there. Um, this included things like a visit to 52 Queen Street, James Young Simpson's home, which is still there, the only one in the row with an extra story because his family and his practice and his social life were bursting his home at the seams. Um, Emily would have come here every day and climbed to the second story to the consulting rooms. On the day that I walked by to take this picture, the door was open, so I, walked in. Um, it's a drug counseling center, so I wasn't really trespassing on private property, and I wandered around a little bit inside until they asked me to wander out again. Um, but even that brief glimpse gave me some insight. Uh, for instance, the back staircase where the banister still has James Young Simpson's Latinized initials worked into the banister, I-Y-S, which both shows you what Emily saw on her way into work every day and tells you a little bit about Simpson because what kind of guy puts his initials in his own banister. Um, I also got to go to the wonderful museum of the Royal College of Surgeons, which I highly recommend if you're into the, high, into the history of medicine or 
or um, scary things in jars. They have a wonderful, wonderful pathology museum as well. Um, they wouldn't let me take pictures, but I had my sketchbook. On the left there, um, Simpson's pocket pill case with compartments for horrifying things like mercury and laudanum, opium. Um, it says, please return to 52 Queen Street under the lid. And he would have taken this on his house calls. Uh, down below his monaural stethoscopes in rosewood and ivory. I, I wanted to believe that one of them might even have been one that Emily borrowed and used while she was helping in his consulting rooms. They even had the decanter from the chloroform. Um, so Emily is learning medicine at, the, at, at, at a very high level in Edinburgh. It's not enough, unfortunately, to protect her from the same kind of media snark that Elizabeth also came in for when she first set herself on this path. This is a caricature from the London satiric newspaper Punch meant to show Emily in the appalling bloomer costume of the women's rights advocates, of which she was not, interestingly. Um, anyway, Emily in bloomers with a ridiculous hat and a rather mannish profile, gazing, um, peering through spectacles um, at the only patient who would consult a female physician, a lapdog being clutched in the arms of a more conventionally attractive maiden. Um, the accompanying article said something like, women doctors are fine as long as they get married quickly because really their only use is to look after their husbands and children. Um, happily, neither Emily nor Elizabeth had any trouble ignoring this kind of silliness. So now Emily has finished her training and she at last converges with Elizabeth in New York, where in 1857, they found the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children in a building at the corner of Bleecker and Crosby Streets, which is still there. You can go and visit it. It's actually um, been uh, wonderfully restored even since, since the photo on the right was taken. Um, and I have had the privilege of um, befriending the woman who has done that restoration. And she allowed me into the building while she was restoring it to get a sense of what those wards would have looked like, um, getting to see the original windows and the brickwork, the hearths and the rafters. Um, I got to write the chapter on the infirmary in the infirmary and I really did feel like I was close to the ghosts. Um, the New York Infirmary was the first hospital staffed entirely by women. It was meant to be a place both for uh, poor women in the tenement neighborhoods surrounding to uh, avail themselves of um, female doctors for free. Um, also, it was meant to be a place where the slowly growing numbers of female medical graduates could come and train without having to go to Europe. Um, as you might expect uh, of two women who had just founded a hospital in 1857, um, by 1861, when the Civil War broke out, the Blackwell sisters had an important role to play. Um, just after Fort Sumter, they called a meeting of their donors and supporters in their own parlor and drafted this appeal to run in the New York Times, an appeal to the women of New York and especially to those already engaged in preparing against the time of wounds and sickness in the army. Um, there was a lot of chaotic energy among the women of New York who wanted to support the union cause but had no idea how. Um, in response to this appeal, thousands of them gathered at Cooper Union, another building that's still there, um, to form what would be called the Women's Central Association of Relief, um, an organization that then evolved into the U.S. Sanitary Commission. So you can actually draw a fairly straight line from the Blackwell's parlor to the largest civilian organization of the Civil War. Elizabeth and Emily, as you might expect, became uh, the people in charge of the committee charged with um, uh, finding and training young women to be sent as nurses to the front. Um, and they really threw themselves into this work with great excitement and satisfaction because it really felt like the moment that Margaret Fuller had been describing, men and women standing shoulder to shoulder in the service of a great cause, um, women uh, taking leadership roles. But that excitement and that, that, that rush 
um, faded and turned to dismay and some frustration after a while. It became clear that the male physicians of New York were not unanimous, unanimously interested in standing shoulder to shoulder with female physicians. It was one thing to work with people like Dorothea Dix, who was put in charge of operations in Washington. Um, she had no medical experience. She was just an organizer. She was someone whom Elizabeth Blackwell had no respect for. She called her the meddler in chief. Um, the, the Blackwell's own hospital was left off the list of hospitals that would be helping to train the young woman, women to be nurses at the front. And the Blackwells became more and more frustrated um, and dismayed that they weren't really leading in the way they knew they were capable of doing. So after a year, they withdrew their um, support of the war effort and turned their attention to a new challenge, their next, um, their next big project. Um, the Blackwells had never endorsed the idea of um, single sex medical education. They had thought by their example of succeeding in men's medical schools to have made men's medical schools co-educational, but that hadn't happened in the years since more and more female medical colleges had opened and um, there really weren't any women following in their footsteps and going to men's medical colleges. The products of these female medical colleges were mediocre. The Blackwells knew this because they were showing up to train at the infirmary and their training in school was not, not particularly impressive. So the Blackwells reacted to this by changing their minds uh, and actually founding a women's medical college of their own attached to their New York infirmary in 1869. Um, their medical school would actually be a more challenging and rigorous place than either of the any of the medical schools they themselves had attended with men. Um, the Women's Medical College of the New York Infirmary would be three years instead of two. It would have a progressive curriculum that built on itself rather than repeating itself. And it would include practical instruction at the bedside because it was attached to a training hospital. These were all innovations that were, um, that were forecasting change in medical schools that would follow. Uh, it happened first at the Blackwell's Infirmary and their medical college. Um, so the degree of rigor um, was higher there than at any existing men's medical school. So that was sort of the climax of their professional lives together. Um, personally, their stories were just as interesting. Both sisters adopted daughters. Um, Emily lived with her partner and fellow surgeon, Elizabeth Cushier, for the last several decades of her life. Um, two of their brothers, Henry and Sam Blackwell, married two of the most prominent feminists of the day, Lucy Stone, the suffrage activist, and Antoinette Brown, who was the first woman in this country to be ordained as a minister. Um, complicating the story further, uh, the Blackwell sisters, Elizabeth and Emily, did not always see eye to eye politically with their new sisters-in-law, um, Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell, uh, were not eager to uh, throw their hat in with the women's rights movement. Um, they often had a fairly dim view of women in general, interestingly. Um, it's a complicating factor in this story that I find particularly interesting and modern in some ways. There's a degree of female misogyny in this story that is unfortunately all too familiar. Um, Further complicating the story was the fact that Elizabeth and Emily didn't always agree on what it meant to be a woman doctor. As I said, Elizabeth Blackwell early and, and steadily gravitated toward public health and moral reform. Her idea of what a woman doctor should be was a teacher armed with science, someone who could teach ideas about hygiene, about prenatal care, about prevention. Um, Emily Blackwell believed that a woman doctor was someone, a woman who could be as skilled a surgeon and medical professor and obstetrician and gynecologist as any man. Um, and so after the founding, just after the founding of the Women's Medical College, the sisters parted ways with some relief. Elizabeth went to England where she spent the last four decades of her life. Um, she had always wanted to return to the country where she had uh, had her early childhood and she pursued public health and moral reform projects. Um, Emily remained in New York and ran the institutions they had founded with great skill, um, almost 
preserving her sister's legacy to the detriment of her own in some ways. Um, they never lived in the same place again for the last 40 years of their lives. Um, I like to uh, I like to end with this photograph and um, and its story as as evidence of why the Blackwell story is a great one for right now. Um, if you Google Elizabeth Blackwell and you go to images, you will always see this photo. It comes up every time. I have seen it uh, as an illustration on articles, websites, um, documentary films, at least one biography. Um, this is not a picture of Elizabeth Blackwell. It's a lovely portrait, but it's not her. How do we know? Well, at the Museum of the City of New York, where this photo lives, if you flip it over, you will see that it was taken at Dana's Photo Portrait Gallery on 14th Street and 6th Avenue, an institution that did not exist until the mid 1880s. And no matter how well preserved, this is not the picture of a woman in her 60s, which is what Elizabeth Blackwell was in the 1880s. It's probably a picture of one of her nieces. Um, it's a lovely photo of a woman who looks like she's gazing into the future. Why does this misidentification persist if it's clearly not her? Well, I think it's because this is how we like our heroines to look. If you Google, if you're looking for an image of Elizabeth Blackwell, first woman doctor, and you go to Google images and you see these, you probably go for the younger one, the one who looks perky and pretty, the one who looks more like a Disney princess. Um, and I think this is such a, a neat illustration of why the Blackwell story with all of its complexity and all of its contradictions is a very important one for us now. Um, female heroines don't have to be perky and pretty in order to change the world. The Blackwells were complicated, prickly, imperfect, very real heroines, and they did change medicine forever for women. Um, thank you very much for listening. I would be more than happy to answer some questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Janice. This was truly fascinating. Um, I want to talk about cross riding personally, <laughs> but let's get through some questions. One of the main um, questions or themes I'm seeing in the Q&A is finance and funding. How were they able to afford traveling to France, Britain? How did they pay for medical school? How was the infirmary um, funded? Certainly. So, right. It's an obvious question, right? How did they, how did they make it from that, that terrifying moment when their father died? Um, well, interestingly, the first thing that happened was that the three eldest Blackwell children, who were all girls, um, the three eldest ones were Anna, Marion, and, and Elizabeth, um, founded a school in their family's living room in Cincinnati. And they kept the family afloat by teaching, by teaching in a school that they had in their house, and later by traveling to take teaching positions elsewhere and sending their earnings home. Um, as their brothers came of age and moved up and into the working world, I think there was an unusual degree of willingness on their part to support their sisters because they were grateful that their sisters had supported them. So as, as, the, as time went on, they were able to depend on their brother's earnings somewhat. Um, and then once they had come back and had founded a hospital, um, they had a small but loyal following of donors um, and then the, the support of New York State because once there was a hospital, they uh, enjoyed the same kind of grant making that the state gave to all hospital institutions in New York. Um, it was never easy. They were always scraping for money. It's one of the reasons that they envied Florence Nightingale who just sat on a pile of donated money all the time. Um, it wasn't their favorite thing to do. Uh, and it was, a, 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 it was sort of their greatest challenge throughout. Yeah. Um, question from Kay. Um, she says, what a story. Uh, were there other women pursuing medical degrees or was it just the Blackwells? There were. And, you know, they, they, their example inspired other women. Um, again, these female medical colleges opened and graduated many women with degrees that um, the Blackwells didn't think were as valuable. Um, then soon the Blackwells were educating their own 
um, students. Um, and they started something. I think by the time the Blackwells died in 1910, um, there were something like 9,000 female MDs in the United States. Amazing. Um, a question from Larry. Did Elizabeth lecture against the germ theory of illness? And did either Blackwell's sister have any dealings with Mary Walker? Ah, two very good questions, separate. Um, germ theory was a, was a vexed question for the Blackwell sisters and they responded to it differently. Um, the idea, uh, Emily was the, was, the, was the scientist, right? Um, so when this, when, when this became known that, that microbes were responsible for disease, not wickedness, but, but actual biology, um, she rolled with that. Uh, she she you know, was able to see that in a, in a, in a scientific context context. It was harder for Elizabeth, who really had come of age and been educated in a moment where sickness was still understood as the wages of sin. Um, and the idea that an amoral microbe might be responsible for illness didn't square with the idea that if you were good, you would be healthy. Um, it, it's interesting to see her wrestling with that. Mary Walker, um, if for those of you who aren't familiar with the name, um, was another American woman doctor, uh, a Civil War heroine, um, who was notorious for dressing like a man. Um, and Elizabeth Blackwell was very irritated by Mary Walker because people would confuse them. And Elizabeth Blackwell thought it was ridiculous to wear trousers. Um, the point was to prove what a woman could do. So she was always very irritated when that confusion happened. <laughs> I like that. Um, this is another question that keeps popping up. Um, if um, Did Elizabeth make any impact on medicine when she went back to England or in her travels? Did she inspire other women in France, England to do the same? Very much. Um, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who is um, in the history books as the first woman doctor in Britain, although you could argue that um, there's, a, there's another story there about uh, an earlier woman who um, passed as a man throughout her life, James Barry. That, that, that is technically the first woman physician in Britain, but she, since no one knew she was a woman until her deathbed, um, she doesn't really count in, this, in these terms. But Elizabeth Garrett Anderson was someone who was directly inspired by Elizabeth Blackwell. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell, once she had founded the infirmary in 1857, went back to England on a lecture tour in, in the late 1850s, just before the Civil War. And there, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson heard her speak and was moved to, to consider that, that medicine might be something she could pursue. And she was the first woman to receive a degree at the Sorbonne. And then she became, came back to found the first women's hospital in London. Great. Um, question from Ina. Um, she read your fantastic book last March. And she has a question. Uh, once you discovered the Blackwells and embarked on this project, what was the biggest surprise you discovered in your research? Mm, surprise. Um, partly just the sheer volume of material. Um, the, the, the idea that these all of these siblings had, had, had written to each other and preserved each other's letters and created this, this, I mean, they say, if, if you don't have enough, if you, if you don't feel like you're drowning in material, you probably don't have enough to write a biography. I was definitely drowning in material. Um, and then also just the, 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 the contrast between the, the Elizabeth Blackwell of the picture books and the Elizabeth Blackwell of her own letters. Um, both Elizabeth and Emily were opinionated, hard-hitting women. Elizabeth, especially though, had an enormous ego. She really had a sense of herself as one of the elect, someone who had been chosen for this mission. And it was at once somewhat off-putting because, um, you know, most of the time we don't spend time with women, with anyone who has that kind of God-given certainty. Um, at the same time, I felt a kind of awe for her and a new understanding that that is what it takes to make the kind of change she was making. Um, so, you know, I think people have often said, well, did you like them? You spent five years with them. Did you like them? Um, yes, I did, because I 
I was raised by teachers who were prickly, fabulous women, just like the Blackwells. Um, but they aren't always easy to be around. And I think that, I don't know if this was a, a surprise as much as sort of a, a deepening epiphany that um, we have to listen to the, to, the, to the wise crones among us and not just the, the perky princesses. Absolutely agree. They sound like somebody who could, you could have like a, a nice cocktail with a glass of scotch and just um, have unfortunately a- they didn't drink, but yes. Well, <laughs> if they were, you know, in these days, <laughs> uh, we have time for I think two more questions. Um, oh, if you could um, just repeat the name of the first female physician in England, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. Okay, great. Thank you. That was for Marianne. Uh, she had a follow up question and. Um, question from Sharon. What was the Dr. Blackwell's feeling about and relationship with the midwives of the time? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, in New York, um, I think I, mm, they were definitely obstetricians. They were, they, their, their hospital was in large part a labor and delivery hospital, um, just by definition. Um, uh, but again, work in a, it, 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 it's hard to remember sometimes that hospital context in the 1850s, 60s, 70s was different than that it is now. Midwives attended at home. Um, most women delivered at home. The people that were coming to hospitals were either because they were impoverished or because there was some terrible complication that required a surgeon or something like that. So the spheres were slightly separated. Um, I think they had tremendous respect for midwives, but they didn't consider themselves at the same social or intellectual level as midwives. Again, midwifery was more the trade, medicine was more the profession. And um, I, I know the answer to this question, but I like the sentiment, how um, Marie phrased it. So um, Marie says, as a na- native Philadelphian who grew up learning about Elizabeth Blackwell and her groundbreaking work, I was thrilled to read your book and very much appreciated the archival work you did to pull this story together. So I'm curious what project you're working on next and what stellar archival collections you might be mining. Thank you for your work on these sisters Blackwell. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry to say that I can't tell you what I'm working on next because I don't know. (laughs) I am, I'm wandering um, and meandering um, towards some ideas always about about, I'm, I'm, I'm always going to stick with border crossing 19th century women because that's an infinite well of stories. Um, I'm curious about the beginnings of the conservation movement in this country um, and some of the stories in there. Um, But uh, right now I'm wandering wherever there is an archive. So stay tuned. Great. And I know everybody who has enjoyed your presentation is going to be eager and rushing to buy the next book as well. Same with the Doctors Blackwell. The link is in the chat for everyone to purchase it. Please do from our independent book sale. And again, Janice will be happy to, uh, to sign that if you reach out to Books on Call. Um, thank you, Janice, for a wonderful presentation. I learned so much. Um, and that's um, always a treat for me personally. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you to our literary committee for making this event possible. Um, this uh, presentation was recorded and you can view it on our YouTube channel probably by the end of day tomorrow. So if you missed parts, please feel free to check it out. Again, you can go to nationalartsclub.org for any further events um, online and in person. Um, And um, again, thank you so much, Janice. Thank you, everyone. Be well all and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Good night. Good night.